More perspective on the IMF's outlook for the Asia-Pacific region. I'm joined live via Skype by Saurabh Gupta. He's a senior Asia-Pacific international relations policy specialist at the Institute for China-American Studies. Good to see you again. Thank you. So we did hear the IMF talking about the economic scarring being a near certainty for the Asia-Pacific region, and it lowered its regional growth forecast for 2020. Meanwhile, you have China, which will see 1.9% growth this year. So start by walking us through China's growth picture and recovery. Uh, China obviously got hit by the virus first, but it has come out also earliest. Uh, just the Chinese themselves put out their third quarter numbers, which were very, very heartening, almost 5%. Uh, China, along with its, some of its Asian peers, are, are, are the few rare oases of growth in the international economic community. And it, it should help, to some extent, help the international economy rebound when it does rebound later next year. Uh, for China, obviously, this is very heartening, even though the number is fairly low, about 2%. But hopefully down the line, as China's emergency measures wears away, it will be China's private fixed asset investment and domestic demand, uh, which will run its economic growth momentum next year, hopefully. So you mentioned some of the, the other uh, countries in the region also seeing some recovery as well. Talk about who they are and how you're seeing COVID, COVID impacting some of the other leading economies in the region. Uh, the other economies in the region are primarily East Asian ones which have done well. Vietnam's done well. Myanmar's done well. Surprisingly, Bangladesh also has done well, even though India is doing very poorly on the, on the growth front. Uh, but I, I, the East Asian economies, I think, are always primed to grow because, of course, they took that much more care in, t in confronting the virus. Uh, but also many of their products which they export, which they produce and export, like in the electronic supply chain, in the digital supply chain, these are being used that much more. So uh, not at all surprised that they are doing this well. And we hope that Western economies can also turn the corner next year. And we did see China's state councillor and foreign minister Wang Yi recently visiting the Asia-Pacific region to really strengthen regional cooperation. How might China's growth impact the region's recovery? Uh, obviously, China is a huge, huge market. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a huge economy, and the East Asian economy, East and South Asian economies, are deeply intertwined through their supply chains, which run through China. So China's rise obviously does help many of these countries, which produce in intermediates and inputs, which go into assembly in China. But also, as China moves with its dual circulation strategy and becomes a bigger importer of final goods for consumption in its own domestic market. This will also help Asian economies grow out of, grow from this virus and, and, and rebound back quickly as is anticipated next year. Now, something else the IMF raised was this issue of trade deals. Now, depending on the outcome of November's presidential elections in the U.S., what does this mean for the region's trade deals with the U.S. and perhaps other trade deals, for example, the U.K. after post-Brexit? Uh, we, uh, I think the biggest uncertainty here is as to who becomes the next president. Hopefully, if we have a Biden presidency, we would have that much more emphasis on regional, plurilateral, and multilateral market opening and trade liberalization. Uh, what I would like to alert our viewers to is that there's a very important deadline very early in the next presidency. This is April 1st, which is the day on which trade promotion authority expires. It's a very difficult fight to get trade promotion authority. So regardless of who is president, uh, uh, I think trade deals will, be, will, will, will necessarily get delayed until trade promotion authority is obtained, which is, a, as I said, a very difficult challenge on the Hill. Uh, as for existing agreements which are being negotiated, primarily the U.S.-U.K. agreement, uh, there are, of course, the usual trade irritants, but there are other issues like UK's digital services tax, what's going to happen on the hard border with regard to Brexit, which will impact these negotiations. And so while both parties are trying to do it by April 1st, I'm skeptical that they will be able to complete the negotiations by then. And just quickly, obviously, a lot of the world still waiting for a vaccine for COVID-19. Where do Asian countries stand in terms of their work on vaccines? I think they've made tremendous progress. Obviously, the Chinese have made great progress. India is a useful production base uh, with regard to vaccine production and is, and is also capable of ramping up capacity. But I think at this point of time, even as everybody looks forward to the vaccine, we folks need to do the simple things right. Wash hands, social distance, 
try to kill the virus as, as, as in contain it, mitigate it. Do not let many of these containment measures expire prior to, uh, prior to the, having suppressed the virus and continue with targeted fiscal support. So yes, the vaccine is important, but uh, it's still some way away from all parties getting access to it. And I think we should be still very focused on preventative measures at this point of time. Very important to note. Thank you so much. Sarab Gupta there, Senior Asia-Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist at the Institute for China-American Studies.